Hello, I'm Gordon Palmer, minister here at Claremont Parish Church, and this is a service for Sunday, 10th of May. Uh, Bible reading from Philippians will be being done by Janice Bruce, and Leslie Gold will be leading us in the prayers for others. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. So writes the Apostle Paul in the letter to the Philippians, writing from jail. So not saying this because he's had a, an easy time of it, or indeed that the church in Philippi were having an easy time of it. But nevertheless, he gives this command, rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. So, whoever we are, wherever we are, however we've been, we worship God coming to praise Him, to say rejoice. So, come, people of the risen King, who delight to bring Him praise. Let us join together in prayer, and again, we'll gather up our prayers in the words of the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples. The words will be on your screens. Gracious God, we do come to you as people of the risen King. Although in the current situation and we cannot gather together in one place, we do not watch, do not listen necessarily all at the same time. Nevertheless, in Christ and through your Holy Spirit, we come as part of a people, as part of a community of faith, as part of those whom you have called together. And indeed, we come to give you our praise, to say that you are worthy 
to say that as the church of Christ, indeed we can, we should, and we will rejoice. We thank you that you are a God, a God worth rejoicing in for your care and for your provision for us day by day, but also for the gift of Christ as a Savior and for including us in your work, in your mission, in your purposes in the world, and for including us as part of your family, sons and daughters of the living God, as well as people of the risen King. What's not to like? So we come and say thank you. We come and say, yes, in Christ we can, in Christ we will rejoice. Lord, we also say and acknowledge and admit that all too often we have not filled our hearts and our minds with the goodness of God and with all that you are to us and for us. And so there have been times when we've been unnecessarily despondent. There are times when we've given to others and to ourselves the impression that following Jesus is just not worth it. There are times when we've forgotten and overlooked your grace and following you has been a duty and a drudge. Gracious God, forgive us for these and forgive us for all our sins and the many ways in which we have come short of all that you have asked and called us to be. Assure us now of your forgiveness. Assure us now of the peace that comes with God, knowing that we are forgiven people. And might we, as forgiven, as redeemed people, serve you with joy, live for your glory, and bring honor in the name of Jesus, our Savior, in whose words we gather up our prayers. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from time and trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. I want to read two verses from Paul's letter to the Galatians at chapter 5, verses 22 and 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Jesus is the reason for the season. Put Christ back into Christmas. Yeah, I, I know it's only me, but <clears throat> these are the kind of slogans, just examples of slogans that have been used by Christians to counter the trend in society that each Christmas we, we forget what's most important. Each Christmas the focus seems to be on cards, on gifts, on parties, on food, on what we're drinking, and the reason for the season is forgotten. Christ is pushed out of Christmas. But hey, that's not just a failing of the world around us. Um, I think too often that's the case for church folk as well. Too often it's the gifts, the parties, the other events that take up our main effort and interest and attention, and not the fact of God's great gift of a Savior come to us. But not only at Christmas, it's all too easy at all year round for us to lose a Jesus focus. Really, Ask yourself this, how focused, how explicit has my experience of church been on our becoming more Christ-like? How much emphasis have I put on becoming more like Jesus day by day? Now, I know, and I'm sure you know too, what's the correct answer to these 
But only a casual glance is needed in the direction of the church today to see that while becoming more Christ-like is something that we might say that we're about, when it comes to living that out, when it comes to putting that into practice, we've not done so well. It's a criticism that I, we hear from time to time from folks in, in society beyond the church saying things like, well, you know, I really like Jesus. I can get interested in Jesus. It's the church I don't like. Now, I think sometimes people say that just as a way of, of pushing it to the side. They, they're saying they like the Jesus that, that they think exists as opposed to the Jesus of the gospel. But sometimes there's substance. It's, it's something that people say, and, and in this case, there's no smoke without a fire. There's some substance to the fact that somehow we have not portrayed, shown the way and the love of Christ to the world around us. And part of the reason for that, part of the problem is that too few of us explicitly acknowledge and focus and work at becoming more Jesus-like day by day. <clears throat> for most days, we might go to bed at night thinking we've had a good day, if we've been happy, that we've had a conversation with family members or friends, we've maybe enjoyed a meal, maybe the sun was shining when we were taking the dogs for a walk, or, or whatever. Maybe we've gone through a day at work without being too stressed. Oh, it's been fine. It's been a good day. And so that happens the next day or the day after that. And where then has our Christian growth gone? aim at nothing, and that's exactly what you hit. So, unless we aim to grow in Christ-likeness, unless we choose to work at becoming more like Jesus, then it won't happen. It doesn't happen. And that's what's affected, that's what's infected so much of the church's impact, the church's witness, and the world around us. We've not grow in the life of Christ sufficiently, that that's what the world sees in us. And in this time of lockdown, of challenges right, left, and center, this time when there's been threats to and questioning of our lifestyle in the Western world, I'm convinced that one of the best gifts that the church can give to the world is to show a more Jesus way, to live more fruitfully for Jesus. A lot of people's assumed certainties, a lot of people's taken for granted are under threat. And people don't need some quick, facile solution about a new way of life. They don't need us to simply shout at them, Jesus is the answer, when they're not quite sure what is the question. They need the church to show something of a different way of being, show something of a different lifestyle, show something of an alternative, a Jesus way of life and living. Now, that's one reason why we're spending these Sundays looking at the nine fruit of the Spirit that Paul mentions in Galatians 5 in the verses that I read a few moments ago. And notice in the verse 22, Paul says fruit of the Spirit. He doesn't say fruits of the Spirit. He doesn't think it's okay for us to have some of the fruits and not others. He doesn't think it's okay for us to have some gentleness, to have some faithfulness, a wee bit of kindness, and well, that's our orchard full enough or busy enough. No, he's saying that if the life of Christ grows in, as if the Holy Spirit is bringing the work and the ways of Jesus into fruition in our lives, we will see all nine flavors. We will see all nine of these different fruit growing together. Now, he said last Sunday that if someone's a Christian, then they have the Holy Spirit with them. That's the gospel promise. We, we believe, we turn to God, we receive the Spirit. There are no Christians who do not have the Holy Spirit. There are no people with the Holy Spirit who are not Christians. It's the Spirit of Christ who is given to us and given to all Christians. And one of the ways that we know that someone is a Christian and we know that we are Christians, that we know that the Spirit is with us is when the fruit of the Spirit grows. 
Now, that's not just something that we sit back and let the Holy Spirit do for us. Oh, it's the fruit of the Spirit. The Spirit will see to that, and I don't have to bother. Not so. I mean, one of the the nine, the last that Paul mentions is self-control. That in itself is quite clear that it's not a case of sitting back and letting it happen to us. No, we've got gardening work to do. We have to learn how to tend and prune, how to irrigate the field, how to keep birds and squirrels away, how to watch out for blight and for mold, how to remove parasites and and weeds that suck the life out of the plant and so on. We have to ensure there's enough feeding for the fruit to grow and appear. Now, a farmer has to do these things for his crop to grow, but the farmer has not provided the life. The farmer has worked at giving the right help and the right conditions for the harvest, but the life itself was what God has made. Similarly, in our lives, it's the presence of the Holy Spirit. We need the Spirit's life, but also, as well as that, we need ourselves working at feeding, tending, pruning, fighting off disease, and so on. Not so that we become better at love, joy, peace, and so on for their own sake, but so that we can grow in becoming more like Jesus. For that is what every Christian is called to be and to become more like Jesus. So, we started the series on the food of the Spirit last week, looking at love, the first on the list, and today we turn to joy. Now, that's not a word that many people beyond church associate with us. Maybe that's due to Christianity being portrayed as a a list of don't do's. Don't do this, don't do that, give up such and such. Or maybe it's because our style of things is or is seen as being dull. Or maybe it's because we don't give the impression ourselves that we have a good time in and with church, and that like everyone else, we just need to put that stuff to the side to go on out and truly enjoy ourselves. Now, last week I was saying that we should learn to love one another, not just because it's a command, a basic command of the gospel, a command of Jesus, but also because love is who God is. And in a similar way, joy is not something that we should just simply be commanded to do, but joy is something that is the natural response to seeing God at work, to God's salvation being given to us and coming among us. Let's take Luke's gospel as an instance, as an example here. Luke's gospel begins with with joy at the angel's announcements about the birth of John the Baptist and then the birth of Jesus. John, while still in his mother Elizabeth's womb, leaps for joy when Mary, who by this time is carrying Jesus, comes into the same room. There is joy in the Mary's song of response that passage we call the Magnificat, and then right through to the shepherds' praise after they've been to visit the Messiah. Joy, joy, joy all over the story. God is on the march. God is on the move. And then joy is the clear individual and social response that is marked out when Jesus announces in the synagogue in Nazareth who He is and what He's about. He quotes from Isaiah chapter 61, And in Isaiah 61, we're told that that announcement of God's servant at work is a cause for joy. And we have that passage then in Luke chapter 4. And then further on, Luke chapter 10, when the disciples are first sent out to do Jesus' work, sent out in mission, they come back, we're told, full of joy, verse 17 of chapter 10, because they were joining with, they were collaborating in the Messiah's work. God's on the march. God's on the move. God's doing things. And the response? Joy. Joy again was underlined in the three parables about the lost in Luke chapter 15. Joy not just experienced on earth, but also verses 7 and 10 in the heavenlies as well. Salvation found through the Messiah's ministry is a source of joy on earth and in heaven. And then, of course, joy is where Luke's gospel finishes, because joy is so present after the resurrection, but we're even told 
chapter 24 at verse 41, that the disciples weren't very sure at first if they could believe Jesus because of joy. They were were saying, this is too good to be true. Joy remained, verse 53 of that chapter 24. Joy remained after Jesus' ascension, because although Jesus had gone, the work was going on, and the promise of the Holy Spirit was being made real. And so Luke took the story on too when he wrote a a second volume, the book that we know as the Acts of the Apostles. And again, from the earliest experience of the first church in Acts chapter 2, and through the mission going out across um, Jerusalem and Samaria, and then throughout the Roman Empire, joy, joy, joy is the outcome of seeing God at work. And so as the gospel was shared, as God's salvation was enjoyed by others, joy flowed. Now, I want to turn um, to the Apostle Paul's writing, one of his later letters to the church in Philippi, and Janice is going to read from us from Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1, verses 12 to 26. Now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. And because of my chains, most of the brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord and dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. It is true that some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others out of goodwill. The latter do so out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former preach Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing that they can stir up trouble for me while I am in chains. But what does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached, and because of this I rejoice. Yes, and I will continue to rejoice, for I know that through your prayers and God's provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or death. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I am to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet what shall I choose? I do not know. I am torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far, but it is more necessary for you that I remain in the body. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and I will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith, so that through my being with you again, your boasting in Christ Jesus will abound on account of me. Amen. I want to highlight two things um, from that passage that Janice has just read. Firstly, I want to say that joy is not necessarily just tied up with the circumstances in which we find ourselves. Paul is talking about joy in these verses, but at the same time, he tells us where he is. He's uh, in chains, verse 13. He's in prison. That is, he's not describing his joy or why the Philippian church is to be joyful because everything is going well for them on the surface. Here is a missionary, here is an evangelist shut up in confinement. It's a bit like a concert pianist being asked to to play um, to an audience with his hands tied behind his back. How can I do it? I'm I'm being held back. I'm being restricted here. But Paul is joyful because gospel ministry is continuing. Brothers and sisters are speaking out and and, and sharing faith. That is, Paul sees his own life not just about himself, but in the bigger context of God's work in the world. For I know that through your prayers, he says, verse 19, and God's provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. 
I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed. See his enthusiasm? God's at work, God's purposes, and even if I'm in jail just now, it's going to work out somehow. I know not how yet. You see, it's not all about Paul. It's not about his fame or his safety or his comfort. The source of joy, and we saw that in this Luke's gospel, the source of joy is not in the personal circumstances, but in God's mission, God's salvation growing. So the shepherds who'd been out in the field, greeted by the angels and given the news of joy, went down and saw the the newborn Jesus. And when they returned, we're told in chapter 2 of Luke at verse 20, they were praising God. They were joyful. Aye, but they were still shepherds. They still had the rest of the night's work to do and tomorrow's work. It wasn't joy because suddenly they'd become magistrates and everything was working out brilliantly well for them. They were going back to the same thing. But God had put that in a wider, bigger context that that said even this same thing is going to be different because the Messiah is here. Now, this is not to say that Christians should be such oddities that we have to be seen to be happy no matter what goes on. A friend of mine, a number of years ago, and it was so many years ago, in fact, that uh, it was in the days when you, were, you could stand at uh, football matches, and this friend of mine was standing on the terracing at Pitodre watching a game between Aberdeen and Celtic. And he had a couple of um, badges. It was the 70s. There was these badges that people sometimes were wearing when they were Christians. He had a couple of these stickers on his jacket saying that he was a Christian. And um, <clears throat> somebody came up to him some point in the second half, and said to my friend, are you a Christian? I am, said Stephen. Then why aren't you smiling, said the guy. Well, as he told me the story, Stephen said, what? Aberdeen are getting beat 3-1, and he says, why are you not smiling? Of course he wasn't smiling. But that didn't mean he would have nothing to smile about. It didn't mean that it would spoil the rest of his day or the rest of his weekend. He wasn't the kind of guy that would go home and send the kids to bed just because his team would get beat. We go through different experiences. Jesus wept at the tomb of his friend Lazarus. Jesus knew that Lazarus was about to be raised, but still there was a place for grief in the face of death and bereavement. So, we're not saying here that Christians are supposed to be so unusual or bizarre that they don't feel hurt and soreness and so on. The Psalms give us many examples of believers wrestling with God, challenging, raging, questioning, and so on. But the resolution of these things in the Psalms comes when the psalmist begins to glimpse the bigger picture to see what is going on in his life is only a part of what God is doing and a part of who God is and what God is about. Jesus moved on from the sorrow about Lazarus to seeing that Jesus' own raising of Lazarus was to be a sign of God's salvation. So, joy isn't just tied up with our circumstances. That's not saying the same thing as saying, well, we should be odd and be happy no matter what's happening. But it is to say that our circumstances and our lives have to be seen in that context of of God's wider work, God's wider calling. That's the first thing. And the second thing from Philippians 1 is to say that joy is an essential part and integral to faith. Paul puts joy and progress in the faith together, verse 25. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain, and I will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith. Progress. Growing fruit and fruitfulness results in joy. Our Christian progress and joy in that progress should go hand in hand. And indeed, that's noted throughout the rest of the letter of the Philippians. Two Christians who are having a row and division between them, Paul says, he wants unity. Then make my joy complete, he says, chapter 2, verse 2, by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. 
grow the fruit of understanding and reconciliation, and, 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 and I'll be happy. It will be a cause for joy. Seeing one another and, and sharing one in, uh, together in Jesus' work and mission, verses 17 and 18, too, were a cause for joy. Sharing gifts and service, Paul says at the end of that chapter, is a cause for joy. And even in chapter 4 includes the giving of monetary gifts, giving money away to others for God's work is a pleasure. If it's for the extension of God's mission in the world, then giving makes us happy, right? Right? So then joy is not just personal, but joy comes when the Christian community together grows, both in number and in fellowship and unity. So then put these things together. Joy is not just tied up with our own circumstances at any one point in time. Joy is integral to faith. And joy is not about a particular way or style of doing things. One person's joyous time is another person's frivolity. One person's sense of decorum and showing respect is another person's dreariness. We are different. So joy is not found by us all being the same and doing things the same way. And the joy that is the fruit of the Spirit is not about a style of doing things. And nor is the joy that is the fruit of the Spirit something that we can work up by deciding to be happy. And yet, Paul does command the Philippians to be joyful. Verse 1 of chapter 3, Further, my brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. Or at the beginning of chapter 4, with which I began the service, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. But notice the joy comes not by them saying, right, I'm going to make myself, I'm going to make myself happy even if it kills me. The joy comes as they see who they are in Christ. Rejoice in the Lord always. Rejoice verse 1 of chapter 3, in the Lord, so that it's in Christ, in seeing who we are in Jesus, in seeing that Jesus has died and has risen, that Jesus is reigning for us, that the risen Jesus is interceding for us, seeing that the, that the risen Jesus is preparing a place for us where we will experience God's eternity and all its fullness. It's through that identity and participation in Christ that we're given cause to joy. It is through our being touched by the hand of God, our readiness to see what God's doing in the world and commit ourselves to that, that joy comes. Joy comes from the experience of salvation, the privilege of being a son or daughter of the living God and being part of His work in the world. And we need to remind ourselves of these great gospel truths taught in the Scripture, but also then to involve ourselves, commit ourselves to our taking part, our participation in that gospel work in our place and in our time. So that, to go back for a moment to the illustration of um, plants, the way for a plant to grow and become healthy. It's not just we, that we pull it out the ground every so often to see how its roots are doing. No, it's as the, the plant opens itself to the feeding and the, the sun and the rain. And in the same way, we do not make ourselves joyful. The way to joy is not looking inside us and trying to make ourselves different, looking underneath. It's looking up and beyond to the God who has chosen us, the God who has called us, the God who is at work in our lives. And it's the focusing on that that we have to make a priority day by day, not such that we don't do anything else, but to make sure that in doing everything else, part of that focus for each and every one of us is that daily growth in Christ. When we don't do that, we drift. Paul, to go back to chapter 1 in Philippians, finds himself torn between what he wants, whether he wants to live on 
and continue his ministry with all the knockbacks and the kicks and the suffering that that entailed, or whether he would be with Christ. But he recognizes that his fulfillment would be, will come through his being with Christ. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. I don't know what to choose, he says, verse 22. I'm torn. But I want to be, most of all, in and with Christ, he says, verse 26. Do we believe that the Jesus who says, follow me, is a Jesus who wants the best for us? Do we believe that the Jesus who said that daily we had to take up our cross and follow is not some sadistic taskmaster, but one who deeply loves us and wants not only what is good for us, but wants us to enjoy that as well? Do you believe that's who He is? For it's in trusting and in following such a Jesus It's in finding ourselves in the care and the embrace of such a Savior that means that we don't even have to tell ourselves to be joyful. Joy comes when we know that that's whose we are, when we know that that's who the Jesus is who calls us, when we know that we are given that place and that privilege of being with Him and sharing in His work in the world even in the times when it doesn't mean the circumstances are right and dead easy, even in the times when there's challenges, joy comes because we're part of a bigger picture. And as like the healthy plant, we, we reach out before the sun and the rain, reach out before the truths of the gospel and drink them in, so we flourish. And to flourish means flourishing joyfully. Let us pray. Gracious God, help us more and more to have the clarity about all that You want us to be and all that You call us to be. Forgive us for the times when we've not shown Jesus clearly and faithfully to the folks around us, including the times when we've let our picture, our our understanding of you slip, and we've not been filled with joy. Through your Spirit, Spirit, Lord, grow joy in us. Help us to work at the growing of joy in us as we see who we are and whose we are in Christ. Most of all, Lord, might we do that, that we bring you glory. Amen. Tension of the Apostle Paul and knowing that the best is in Christ is something he wrestled with throughout that letter to the Philippians. And we now sing a hymn that is based on um, just a slightly later passage uh, in Philippians than Janice read, the hymn, All I Once Held Dear. After we've sung this, we'll share our faith together in the words of the Apostles' Creed, and then Leslie will be leading us in prayer.
I believe in God the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and death. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son and our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under the conscious fire, was crucified, died, and was raised. He descended into the dead. Upon the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, Let us pray. Father God, we pray that every step we take today is ordered by you. Thank you for your provision, strength, peace and joy. May you erect a fence of protection around us, our homes, jobs and loved ones. May you continue to bless and heal us. We bring before you our prayers for others as we live through this strange time. The lives of all of us have been altered suddenly in the past few weeks because of COVID-19. Scientists and governments worldwide wrestle with evidence, safeguards and plans to reduce infection rates and to produce treatments and ultimately a vaccine. As NHS and care workers continue to look after the sick and the frail, may they be upheld by your strength and comfort. We pray for all who have recently lost a loved one and are missing the comfort of others during this difficult time. Be near to all whose anxiety levels are rising due to insecurity regarding work and those struggling in unstable relationships. On this, the beginning of Christian Aid Week 2020, we know that in common with many charities, it will be a struggle to carry out their commitments for the world's poorest and most vulnerable people. This year, the slogan of Christian Aid is, Love Never Fails. And we pray that you will unite all of us, near and far, in love and care for each other. We pray for all government leaders as they work tirelessly to monitor the current situation and hope they will seek your support in all they undertake. We ask you to uphold our ministry team and those in other places as they endeavour to comfort the bereaved and motivate all in your name. In the words of a Christian song, hope has a name, his name is Jesus. And in his name, we ask your blessing on these prayers. Amen. It's finally, before we sing our closing prayers, just to remind folks that the Congregation magazine, the quarterly magazine, The Clarion, has now been and printed is issued and again just a reminder if you haven't had a copy and think you should have had one do please get in touch even if you don't think that we you were on our mailing list and you would like to have one then again also get in touch and um, go onto our website and or whatever and and chase the um, address for the the office and and uh, leslie will be able to sort you out for a clarion also want to mention that um, the week after next, the week beginning Monday the 18th, we're going to uh, start on a how to pray course. We're looking to have groups of, um, small groups of six to eight people uh, looking at that course together. Um, it's a course much recommended. And I think during this time of lockdown, when we've been aware of, of um, cutoffs, of not seeing and not being in touch, here's one thing that we can do, work at how we can stay better in touch with the Lord and how that we can enjoy His presence, a presence that can never be taken from us. <clears throat> to mention the, um, the sad news that we've had this week of the death of two of our members, um, Mary Ingalls, who's formerly in Loch Assent, and, and Doris Reed, formerly in Cumbria, 
and both had been in uh, uh, the care home at White Hills, and, and both died during the week. Um, <clears throat> the funeral details for Mary are still, uh, when we're recording this, not known. Um, and the funeral details for Doris um, are known. Um, going to be, the service is going to be on the morning of Wednesday the 20th. Again, for both instances, the funerals will be taking place under the um, restrictions of uh, the COVID time in which we, we live. Now, our closing hymn is Joy to the World. Now, you might have thought I'd lost my um, sense of a time of year when I began preaching and saying Jesus is the reason for the season and put Christ back into Christmas. And you might think I've lost it again. Joy to the world, is that not a, a Christmas hymn? Well, I looked back and certainly any time we've sung this at Claremont in the last 10 years has been in December. And it is a hymn that is associated with Christmas. But as I, as I looked again at that hymn, I thought, it's, hey, it's only the first verse that's about the birth of Jesus. The, 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 the hymn continues with further and more about the work of Christ. And Christmas, in terms of God with us and God among us and the birth of Jesus, is not something restricted to that one time of year. So, joy to the world is something that God gives all year round and something for us to know all year round and something that we receive not just by focusing on the birth of Christ, but His life and death and resurrection and indeed His coming again. Therefore, it's fine, even though it's May, to sing together joy to the world, and after that we'll conclude our service in the words of the grace. Mm -hmm.